We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are, are all united. united. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you all today with us. Um, so this is actually a continuation of a panel we, we hosted last year. We had a very fruitful discussion on what exactly is the future of, of IoT in relation to its security. And I think that our outcome, my panelists can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that our outcome was very much that we need security by design. Now you may say, What's the big innovation there? What's the big idea? Well, first of all, at least we came to a consensus. That seems like positive enough for an IGF session. But more than that, we discussed some avenues through which that could be carried out. Uh, I see that some people who were in last year's panel are here today as well. So welcome back to, to, to our audience. Um, well, you're, you're less of an audience and more as uh, participants in the panel. I would like to think that this is a very interactive discussion. Please share your view, your view with us. I'll be monitoring the chat, everybody uh, in the session as well. We have J1 supporting us. She'll be also monitoring the chat. And without further ado, uh, I would like to get to the point how we get security by designing IoT. So just to get back to, to our previous discussion, we were exactly getting to the point that without engaging with manufacturers, without establishing a system within the industry, this would be a very difficult task. We actually need policies. We can't simply rely on the, on the goodness of, of people's hearts because it, it is no, not so much so a matter of people not wanting their devices to be secure. It's more of a matter of how do we actually get this in a system, right? Well, what is the system that we can establish to actually try to get to the results that we desire? What kinds of policies are we looking at and what kinds of mindset do we need to establish? So to get our conversation started, I would very like to ask our good friend, Edgar Ramos, who will share some policy insights with us. Uh, he's a, a man of the industry. He very much has his hands on this matter in a very physical way. So it would be really interesting to hear your thoughts, Edgar. Over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, yes, hopefully you can hear me well. Perfectly. Okay. So the idea is that uh, today we live in a world where basically is uh, all or nothing whenever you get a service. So basically every application, every IoT um, service we are, we are trying to get basically comes with a user agreement. And then it, there is a tickle one box that it says, you accept this and if you don't accept it, so there is something in the text that you thought that, well, I'm not okay with this. But then it's either you take it or leave it. You don't have more options. And part of the problem is that this huge user agreement that you have, basically it's not, or it haven't been yet done in, in a way that can be digitalized and it can be made possible to even negotiate and come and say like, by the way, here you are saying you are recording all my data in China or in, and US, I'm, I'm a European citizen and I would like my data to be in Europe. So can I negotiate this, this part? Uh, even so, there could be other, 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 other things like non-functional requirements. I mean, th this we are talking about a little bit about privacy, about other things, but then also there could be things like in logistics, 
you can and, and then you make a, an agreement and you say, well, you know, these are the bananas that you're going to transport from point A to point B. You have to keep these bananas from uh, 15 to 20 degrees refrigerated. And then that is an agreement that you do basically in, the, uh, in your contract. But then could you actually propagate these agreements even further to your machine so that they understand that this kind of new container that is coming, which has bananas, has to be kept between certain conditions. So they, this is what we call the policies. So the policies are non-functional requirements, which are basically regulating the interactions between businesses, between people, and even regulation between governments. So the government might have a regulation imposed in, in, in people like such as you have to um, you have to declare your taxes after uh, whatever period of time. Well, that's a policy and it was given by the, by the government. So then these kind of things are, we are looking at ways, how can we actually dynamically express them so that you could actually negotiate them. That's one, one of the things, enforce them or monitor them because many times you are not gonna be able to enforce them. But you can at least monitor and say, okay, this policy was accomplished or not. So all this is given uh, uh, the possibility that in the future, there could be new business models where you actually could do this kind of customization so that the industries and, and consumers could have the power to, for example, have a profile of policies where it says, okay, all the data that is Re referring uh, to my personal data, so that is referred to me, has to be processed in my own equipment, for example. And then when you get a service agreement, there might be service agreements that they are okay with that, and there might be service agreements that they are not okay with that. And then they will tell you, well, by the way, you have this policy that is in conflict with your service, so either you accept to negotiate it, or then we cannot give you the service. But they could be maybe a competitor which has a similar service and then actually can uh, provide you the, the can provide you the, the, the service that this uh, other uh, company couldn't do. So then the idea of this dynamic policing is to pro give a new um, tool for the industry and IoT in general so that we can actually have more power of decision, we can also uh, can have more control of how the things are gonna be done. And then also model these non-functional requirements, which are very important in use cases. And, and somehow it has been overlooked because everything is you know, normally done legally with, with legal agreements or these user agreements. But then you could have these uh, digital contracts today that can be helping uh, uh, to, to develop these kind of policies in that sense. Then there is also working intents. I don't know if you have heard about it, but then there are some uh, intent-based uh, uh, networking, for example, and even applications so that you give a goal to a system and then the system with AI try to, to, um, to make that goal through. Then with the, uh, the help of policies, you could also regulate how these intents are supposed to be uh, made through. So then uh, this is research at the moment. Uh, the only thing that is close to something like this policy description is uh, one language called Tosca. Uh, but then we have been looking at, is it really um, possible to be used for IoT applications and so on? But there are other type of uh, options that, that have to be explored. And then also we have to look at these negotiation uh, options and then how finally this comes everything together and put in a framework that can be interoperable and working everywhere. So that's the idea of the policies. Thank you very much, Edgar. Uh, apart from bananas, which was my main takeaway, <laughs> I, I, I do think that you that you bring a very interesting point forward. Um, when we talk about policies, we usually discuss this within a very specific context of what a policy is, and and you certainly bring a very, uh, I think, specific 
angle to this, which helps corner a discussion very well. And I think kind of leads very well into Marta's discussion. I think that um, what Marta, at least conceptually what she wants to bring today, very much ties into that, which is how has, what has been the practical implications of the different policy approaches uh, that have been going on? What, what, what are we looking at right now? What are we looking for in the, in the near future? Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you today, Marta. And if you could enlighten us, it would be great. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for this opportunity. And thanks, Ega, for your, for your remarks and your presentation. I mean, yeah, it, it totally made sense. And um, I'd, I'd want to even build up upon that. I would first even start by looking at what COVID-19 brought as far as IET was concerned. Um, we all would have thought that probably there would have been like a big um, shift or transition into IoT um, once COVID came. But unlike, let's say, just the internet that had more traction, more traffic and stuff like that, IoT seemed um, rather on the low side, but gradually it is actually improving. And now we see that um, IoT devices are more used and are running and sending like data almost all the time, but then we realize that these tend to affect the actual um, networks that run them. So we are looking at once um, IoTs are fueling and let's say healthcare, smart cities, what stress is it bringing? We can see some sort of financial stress and then it asks, it brings us back to the question, even when we talk about policy in terms of like your data security and all that, what are some of the economic policies that can also be like addressed to help for like with this health crisis and um, the financial crisis that this might bring because um, we see that now these IoT devices do not come cheap and as people use it or as um, problems come, for instance, one typical example I like to use is the, um, the release 16, that's the 5G release 16. 3G PP, which was delayed by three months due to COVID, that, that alone is like a setback. I mean, that, that came in the, the area of IoT. And then we realized that even after that setback, other releases which are going to come after that are also going to like be affected with some sort of um, delay. So it very, it's very important that the industrial IoT um, enhances their, their network capacity. So those of us like that work with IoT, like manufacturing devices, it's a very crucial point to look at in that regard. Now, we, we see that, like, we talk about data management, AI and computing, which are some of the trends that we should um, um, expect in IoT as time comes on. A typical example is the smart cities. Now. Going forward, we should expect that isn't just custom, like the customers or the consumers that would be using the IoT devices. No. So it means that like these smart cities would also be able to automate and collect data um, like on their own, like through through like video um, surveillance and other 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 things. So then that comes into play uh, um, when. Ega mentioned about you consent to some data agreements, but you're not comfortable with all of these. Now, here is the case where the smart devices would be collecting this data and be managing it. How secured are we then looking at uh, and providing just our data, like private and personal information? And now IIT has evolved that now it intrudes like personal privacy almost every time. So how then? Um, do we see to drive this in such a way that we as the consumers are not affected? We see um, um, 5G, which is like now connecting people faster. And now uh, um, China even is actually like one of the top nations that are actually um, 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 leading in these IoT innovations because of 5G. So I believe that the EU and other continent other nations also need to double up like such measures to compete 
with the like growing influence over, let's say, China, so that it doesn't look like most of these innovations are just being owned by just um, a single source, so that there is more, should I say, cooperation and collaboration to protect like people's data, to protect people's information, and also to facilitate like um, um, international data transfers um, and all of that. That said, um, I think uh, IoT really, really, really has this, um, should I say, connection with edge computing. And that is one of the key things that right now is dear to me. And I think um, some organizations have started working towards like looking at a bridge between IoT and edge computing. So to say that, for instance, if we have like an autonomous vehicle, which we see um, coming up as something that is rising. And now we are able to see that the vehicle drives on the, um, like on the road. I mean, it's been automated. It collects like signals, data on pedestrians who are crossing, maybe it reads signs, it reads traffic light symbols and all of that. But if the vehicle needs to like stop or in an event of maybe an accident occurring or something, you know, it needs to send data maybe back and forth to the cloud to be processed. And honestly, if we reason through this, it's it's quite, should I say, a longer time in terms of processing that like via cloud back and forth. But then if we should be able to incorporate like edge computing into this, it brings us to a state where we can now have like, IoT sensors to the vehicle to process like the data locally in real time, just so microseconds um, and latencies that may occur. And then that makes it like even a better option for us and, and even a better. So it, it all boils down to, I mean, trying to get these systems intertwined to reduce our overtime, to reduce, um, I'm sorry, the downtimes, and to improve like the, the predictions that are made by these AI systems that drives these IoT applications. So um, that, that being said, I think um, IoT is still going to be the future. And some of like, like the technology roadmaps, yes, might be blocked due to certain circumstances that we do not see. But then the industry needs to be prepared for it. Recently, I joined the um, cluster of excellence at the University of Stuttgart who are working on manufacturing ecosystems for the 21st century. And this time around, we're trying to research into how to make your own DIY recipes that would enable like smarter industries, smarter cities, um, um, to be able to co um, collaborate. I mean, in terms of collaboration, looking at living and non-living things. And if I say non-living things, looking at robots and the likes. So it means these are going to drive and then we need them to be more sustainable. So driving them to, to enable us work well, yet trying to reduce the um, um, implications that we might have. And this all deals with like getting right policies in place getting right people who think um, um, like collectively and then do not think like just within one sector. That is why collaboration is so necessary and needed when that comes into play. And I, I believe that um, going forward, our discussions would not have to be probably on um, um, looking at the threats that IoT poses to us, but rather looking at how we can make this like, like the new normal, the new thing to embrace. And then just as we breathe air without um, um, like being bothered, we are able to live in that and then we are, we are all good to go. So basically, yeah, I think that would be my submission to, to add to what Edgar said. And, and yeah, we could contact me to, to talk more about this because I'm, I'm really interested in stuff like that. Thank you very much, Marta. So what, what I get from, from your intervention is basically that uh, somebody has a positive outlook on IoT. That, that, that's actually great. <laughs> somebody uh, thinks it's going to be, to be just fine. And, and, I, and I, get, I get exactly what you're saying. Uh, this, is, this has been the promise for quite a few years now, right? This has been the promise that 
IoT will actually deliver us great solutions. But in a lot of senses, uh, it has been mostly about how do we how do we we say hello and light up our, the the house rather than life transforming solutions that we are looking for. But hopefully we we are getting there, or at least that's the general idea. I see that we 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 have a raised hand uh, from Watagi. Uh, Watagi, is your comment directly related to to what Marta was saying? Um, yes. Uh, so please go ahead, uh, share your 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 impression with us. Um, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Martha. That was really cool. And yeah, I do find this topic very interesting as well. And um, uh, but you know, my problem that I fear the most is um, overregulation. Um, as you know, there's a new uh, IoT device security law coming up in the EU. And uh, and there are also a few other bunch of laws um, to, that will also affect regulation of IoT devices, um, such as the e-privacy regulation that will come in. In Germany already, there's a law that has come in that already affects IoT devices. Uh, it's called TTDSK. And so like uh, there's already a problem of, of the regulation, especially now in the smart city environment. And I, I, I feel like, um, uh we already have too many policies like we cannot just keep uh saying that oh yeah okay we have this problem more policies more policies um when we haven't even already implemented the policies we have and um i i in my opinion i think um we can look for um solutions that are not uh, uh just more regulatory we can look for more probably citizen-centric solutions. Um, uh, for example, things like, you know, building uh, data trusts. I know you um, proposed a case for edge computing, uh, which is good. Um, uh, yeah, but I think there are also other solutions um, that are also good, like um, uh, uh, tokenization. I attended a session yesterday that talked a bit about it and, uh, and also building things like uh, data trusts, like some privacy by design solution that also like are for uh, for security. And I I was um, wondering what, uh, um, uh, like how all these laws will even affect each other because um, also the there's a new artificial intelligence law. I think everyone heard about it and um, and. They propose a solution called uh, regulatory um, sandboxes. So if everyone is dealing with uh, these um, issues in their own way, every single sector, um, obviously there will be an overlap and like some sort of uh, confusion. And uh, I, I was just uh, my approach would be more a citizen centric solution because. At the end of the day, it's their data we're using or whoever is using, and uh, and uh, I I was just thinking if we just all if the legal side says okay fine we're gonna make more laws and the technical side decides okay we're gonna make more uh, we're gonna come up with more cool things to solve this security problem uh, maybe we will uh, get um, a little lost but I guess that's why we are at the IGF anyway because it's more stakeholder. And um, yeah, so, uh, but I, I just wanted to like uh, suggest a more citizen-centric approach um, where we really put the citizen at the center of the, um, at the center of the solution because at the end of the day, uh, what we want to do is to make life easier for the citizen with IoT. So that, that was just my comment, thanks. Yeah, no, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, for, for broader context, uh, Watagi is not a panelist currently, but she could be. <laughs> she very well could be in this panel. I will do this. I will bookmark uh, Watagi's point and turn it into our first debate question right now. I will hand over to, to our final panelist and we'll get right to that question. 
uh, when he wraps up. So uh, panelists, please um, start thinking about your, your impressions uh, on what has been said. And on the meantime, I will give word to our in-person uh, panelist, the, the one who's holding together the entire venue on his shoulders, um, my good friend and IoT specialist Savio will discuss um, the implementation side of a standard for IoT. What does it actually look like? What does it actually feel like? He is going through the, this right now uh, as a matter of going through his, uh, his uh, post degree. So, Savio, uh, it would be great to hear your impressions of what this actually looks like from the inside. Uh, okay, so thank you, Mark, for the introduction. So I, I'm not that strong, actually. I'm just uh, sitting down here and uh, being present, so I'm not holding anything else. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and by the way, thank you for the soft introduction, uh, softer uh, change from a optimistic view to the pessimist view, but not that much pes pessimistic view. Uh, uh, for the IoT security, but I can do not, nothing else. I can say that about nothing else. If I'm the guy who uh, and anyone asks when something goes wrong, so I have to deal with the problems. And okay, oh, uh, just recapping some things uh, from our uh, last uh, session, and now getting back to our session now. Uh, last session we we debated more uh, about. Uh, like static things on configuring stuff, on the design of this stuff, still in the uh, in the manufacturer's house, uh, and uh, how should we deal better uh, with the communication with, with IoT in the edge computing or something like, like that. But uh, now uh, we have one one uh, workshop more. Uh, talking more with the fluidity that uh, the IoT has, like the things are alive, the mo the closest of alive that we can have. So every time something changes and new vulnerabilities happen and so on. And so when we think about uh, the secure design of IoT, uh, last session we, we uh, stopped in the part of configuring a device. So the starting design of the manufacturer, uh, the, the the design actually the secure design uh, the development of the device and or the system uh, the selection of the product in the shelf uh, and the the first configuration in the the, the uh, end user's house uh, and now uh, we are going to go a bit beyond because the life cycle of an IoT device or systems goes beyond so we have operation. Uh, where in our database is, is the biggest part of the life cycle of a IoT device. And I will get back to this part uh, later uh, to talk about uh, uh, one thing I, I'm working on in ITF. Uh, we have, uh, when something uh, goes wrong, uh, we have sometimes firmware updates from the device's manufacturer. So this is another part of the uh, uh, of the life cycle, and sometimes it, it gets back to the configuration and so on. Uh, so we have some cycles of this, configuring, operating, firmware updating, and then getting back to configuration. Uh, and sometimes the, dev the device uh, reaches the end of life. Maybe the manufacturer does not have any more support on that, uh, or the manufacturer does not exist exist anymore so uh, the device reaches the end of life but we still have left life after the end of life and this was one short discussion we had in the last uh, session from comments from the comments of, of our uh, of the older people uh, in the in the panel uh, sorry in the round table so getting back to the operation and and when things go wrong uh, inside of the operations. Uh, in most of the case, uh, considering uh, the enterprise environment, so uh, in business, in uh, small offices and big offices, in industry, 
uh, and smart farms uh, and anything else, we have uh, a, a kind of team, uh, a kind of team uh, looking for the security of that network, uh, monitoring the traffic with intrusion detection systems, uh, and intru and blocking bad things with with intrusion prevention systems or configuring uh, or with other things uh, as security policies and so on for the the for the that context, but. There are some scenarios where the things goes different, uh, and this is the part that 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 I'm getting into the discussion. Uh, scenarios as uh, home IoT, we have known the, taking care uh, of the security of that uh, home network. So we have like a long. Uh, uh, unauthorized access to devices and so on. Uh, and sometimes uh, we discover when vulnerability ended and the end user does not update the, the software and the firmware of the, the, the IoT device and so on. Uh, and other scenarios, we also have like one short, one small team taking care of security of a big city, for example, in smart cities and lots of different uh, and air heterogeneous uh, network uh, with different devices. Uh, and they just can't uh, follow the process and like see anomalous uh, uh, behavior in the, in the network and then detect uh, attacks or keeping the, the, the updates like in every day. So this is where I go uh, with my proposal. I have currently one, one uh, active draft in the ITF uh, where I try to deal with this thing uh, using well-known knowledge about uh, vulnerabilities or, or uh, malwares, well-known malwares, variants, uh, uh, botnets, and so on. So the point is sharing sharing knowledge. So in the uh, in the the name of the proposal, the, the name of the name of the draft, you can find it uh, with uh, Inksu. I, I call it actually Inshu, but it's I N X U, uh, Internet Network uh, Exposure Analyzer Utility. Uh, and its function is on uh, taking care uh, of finding uh, the uh, threats in the network based in well-known attacks or uh, exploits and, and malwares uh, in a way that uh, someone can describe how an attack can, can be done, like exploiting multiple, multiple vulnerabilities. Uh, and in, in the network, in the final network, uh, that will be one one process verifying uh, how are the uh, which are the allowed connections uh, communications in the network into the networks uh, and then verifying if someone uh, set of the uh, some of that some set of that connections uh, can expose uh, a a DN network to a threat threat sorry. Uh, so this is the point. Uh, what else can I say? So it, uh, it, this proposal takes advantage of one uh, really recent uh, RFC. Uh, we, it's the RFC 8520. It's from 2019. Uh, and uh, this RFC allows uh, one device uh, to when uh, getting to a network, uh, it can announce to the network what type, what type of connections uh, can be expected for them to a well work. And this RFC is focused more on operation than with security. But in technical terms, we can use in the, the, the manufacturer usage description, which is the, the RFC 8520. Uh, we can build a communication graph of the network with the host that uh, are communications and uh, the list of protocols that uh, that are being used. So we can build this type of, of communications. And we have uh, in this proposal developed the uh, malicious traffic description data model where we can describe this well-known attacks and malware uh, 
uh, and sharing with the end users networks uh, or in, in the context, for example, of uh, smart cities, we can set this data to uh, send this data to the end network like a, a small uh, uh, network in the smart city or the the clients of a ISP, for example. Uh, this information will be processed. Uh, this malicious traffic description will be processed among the the mud files that that are related, like the the, the network communication graph. Uh, and then we can find and probably block uh, the exposure of our threats. So uh, yeah, this is basically basically this. Um, this is in the context. Uh, uh, of dealing with uh, the end of life of the of a device, for example, if we have uh, a when well now uh, attack to a device that has not no more support from the manufacturer or any other community, uh, or even during the the process uh, while the, this device is being supported uh, before a firmware update or something like that. So. It's like the to deal with the fluid thing uh, in the life of uh, a IoT device. So that's it for now. Uh, get back, Mark. Thank you. What What I gather from your your explanation is that you you are surviving the the IETF, which you know uh, <laughs> uh, so some of my colleagues from the from the industry would say is is a difficult task in itself. Uh, uh, a salute to all of our friends from the ITF uh, in in the audience. Uh, great stuff to to see you know the this kind of engagement within the 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 ITF uh, environment because it shows that our internet governance community is concerned about these matters uh, at a, at a deeper level than just you know making the technology available. This is something that. Um, I think uh, is a plus for us. The, this shows the the kind of resilience that our, our community has of being able to intervene even when the, the industry doesn't, right? The, this should have been an industry first uh, initiative, but in the absence of that kind of, of standard, we are seeing a few standards emerge. Uh, just recently, we did see uh, initiatives by companies to try to to standardize some of some of their their, their protocols uh, coming particularly in the form at least the one that I that I saw the most was is called matter um, as in you know uh, things that uh, that matter I guess or like the actual materials that compose the word uh, I think Apple is there Google is there but the, this draft keeps being postponed. I think it has been postponed to late 2022 now. And yeah, it falls very much to the community to, to actually uh, act. And with that, I would like to get back to the intervention that Potagi made about citizen-centric uh, questions. And for that, I will turn to our environment, sustainability, um, civil society and all other related matters. Uh, J1, please, J1, uh, you can kick off this this, this second discussion. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, I was uh, really happy that Wataki uh, talk about this citizens matter because um, I personally believe that everyone is a citizen before their profession as a like tech person or government and everything. So uh, without having this uh, citizens or consumer in the discussion, we wouldn't be able to have everyone's a point for the regulation. So um, rather than thinking of like which stakeholder should be in charge of uh, protecting against the cyber attacks, I think we should like coordinate efforts between stakeholder to have a better standard. And um, but um, in the same time, I think like civil society's input is possible only when they have better idea about it and why is it important for them because um, let's say uh, if there's a consumer buying a simple toaster uh, they wouldn't sit down and read the whole section about like if it has been secured enough uh, unless they find it really important 
So uh, to enhance the cooperation within the stakeholders to advance the security, I think uh, we need to first foster a market that offers uh, devices with the security upgrade by increasing the consumer awareness and also um, try to improve the transparency for the consumer by coming up with like a strategy to communicate like security features of IoT devices to consumer. So, um, and uh, in addition, I think by initiating this dialogue within the uh, stakeholders, I think um, we should try our best to not give a specific recommendation or best practice guidance to the uh, people when do not when they do not have a good idea about like why uh, this IoT security is about and why is it important. So yeah, of course we should try to um, increase the knowledge of them as much as possible, and then we can come up with the discussion to share and uh, discuss the solutions. Yeah, I hope our session today will be also contributed. That's all for me. Thank you, Jay Wan. And with that, I open to our other panelists. Um, what are your thoughts on the citizen centric approach? Um, anybody who wants to intervene first, Edgar, Marta, anybody has their finger right there? I think, Marta, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, thinking about that, I think one of the approaches we can use is probably to first have this um, DIY approach, do it yourself approach where people would now be able to like interact directly with these devices, set it up on their own. And that would even influence the um, manufacturer's user guide. I mean, um, because this time it is more personal to people trying to um, more of be their own, should I say, not entirely manufacturers, but now assembling the entire stuff. So you are able to now relate better and then we are able to now get individual like um, um, reasoning towards us because yes, we agree that there are some um, policies in place, but how well are we even um, um, using, making use of these policies in manufacturing IoT devices? It, it hasn't been clear yet. So once we are able to first at a basic level, get probably a marker space or do this um, um, do-it-yourself approach, we are able to understand better and then we can even promote more sustainability because if we talk about like the citizen centric approach we can't just generalize it because even within a particular area there are several um should i say people to even interact with there are several views there are several um usage um, and capacities and all of that so even in that it's still going to be like a broader range that needs to be incorporated into design principles and all of that. So I think um, we could use that approach as well um, um, in gathering this um, citizen-centric um, 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 usage of IoT um, um, devices. Sounds about right. Savio and Edgar, do, do you have uh, any particular reactions or should we move to the next question? Uh, I have uh, only some comments, maybe uh, uh, this kind of, of uh, work when we uh, talking about again the, the how the things change, maybe there is one great uh, a great response for the, the, this kind of claim. Uh, it's the, the project uh, that uh, Edgar is working on, like the things are fluid, uh, there are like some non-functional uh, uh, requirements. So uh, <laughs> this is just one point, just to point it out. Uh, so You've been called out specifically, Edgar, so <laughs> go for it. Yeah, um, I, I think when, I mean, when mentioning this kind of citizen-centric, uh, I'm, I feel that, um, I mean, it, it, it is been looking at it too much from a regulatory perspective. I think um, the best tools are those where people can take their own decisions and they can actually um, can by themselves make their own policies if you want to call them like that. So you don't need a, a, a government to come and, and, and intervene, although 
of course, many times this is done for the protection of consumers and the protection of people. And of course, there need to be a, need to be a, a legal framework for it. But also, I think the the most the, the, the more use cases we deal with, uh, we realize that you cannot cut everything with the same scissors. What it means is that they will be very much sensitive things that are requiring more, much more protection and it requires maybe a more uh, defined formal um, legal framework. And then there are other things like our box of bananas, which doesn't require such a, such a thing. So then the, the, the idea here, I think when, when, when we talk about this citizen centric is more about, you know, make it more uh, free and, and I would say like extendable so that you could actually customize and dynamically decide what, what is the best thing according to your use case. And then this is not only about citizens anymore. So it's also equally applicable to any industry. So as I say, if you have a business relationship, one company with another, and then they decide to establish a policy or a contract between them so that, well, I want you, your deliveries to be done in this time frame with these specific constraints. And then you can share this data with these specific partners. So those are policies. And then that means that um, you don't need a regulatory framework for that. Of course, you could include, and that is something that it will come, I think at some point, you could include provisions to make digital contract enforceable legally, which means that when you come to and make a legal contract, uh, which is uh, basically something that you do right by writing, you could also do them digitally, which today exists certain type of similar um, things that are valid as legal contract. But what I mean is like this kind of including the negotiation process and then coming to an agreement and then finally saying, well, this is what we agree. And then most probably some of these things cannot be enforced directly by the software or hardware that you have in your platform, but you can monitor them. So for example, the ledger in technologies are very popular today for that. So uh, blockchain and so on, so that you could actually do this kind of uh, uh, things. And then the idea is that with that, you can later enforce legally something that was not possible to enforce maybe physically and so on. So then that is the part of the regulatory that we would need to update so that this kind of digital agreement, if we want to call them like that, can somehow have a, a framework, regulatory framework that allows that you could have them and you can enforce them and then make them legally binding as well. Thank you, Edgar. It's, uh, it's good to find out very late in this process that the big banana industry is actually the one pushing this panel forward. Um, uh, you should have disclosed your corporate interest first, but I, I, I'll, I'll still you know, accept your intervention as valid. And yeah, I, I think that th this is actually very good. We, we, we got a, a whole spectrum uh, of opinions on this so great great discussion on this matter and i do you think we have time for another and perhaps yet another after that maybe a quick one after that i don't know so please uh, anybody who would like to to manifest themselves uh, i'll put you on a queue watagi because i will read daphne's question first and get right back to you then so Daphne posed a question that I think we, we touched upon uh, last year. And I think we, we have some thoughts on that for sure, which is how do we actually make people care, right? How do we actually get to them and say, you need to have a look at this device every once in a while. You need to perhaps not imagine that it's taking care of itself, not imagine that it's going to solve its, its own problems. Because publishing scary news on, on, on the media doesn't seem to be doing the trick. 
that doesn't seem to be the solution to, to our, our problems. So how do we actually get users to engage with these policies? How do we make them, them care? They're, they're doing it with their cars, right? They know that every, every so often they have to take their car for a revision. They have to actually look into it. They have to change the tire. They have to do a series of things with their cars. They don't assume that it will take care of itself. Somehow, though, we have created this paradigm in, in technology in which people do assume that it's okay. They do assume that, okay, whatever, the, the, this is good, it's working. If it isn't broken, then it's probably okay. How do we overcome that? Uh, do any of our panelists wants to give a first stab at that? Marta looks like she, she might. Uh, it, 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 do I have a yes from you, Marta? Yeah, sure, sure. I, I, I was, I, I've been thinking through this actually, um, for some time also. It, it seems like you can't, um, push people so much into what they can do and what they cannot do with their devices. But just as you gave your example with the cars, people, um, um always have the need to, like, service their cars, um, and make sure things are working all right. But they don't have the same need for these, um. I hate devices. Why? I think manufacturers can also, um, in a way, put certain restrictions in place in such devices. For instance, if I I speak to maybe my my phone, turn off the lights, and probably I've, I've ignored certain security features for quite some time, it's it decides not to, and then probably prompts you maybe go back to to check this this feature, go back to update your password, go back to do something. I think. Um, yeah, indeed, scaring people of the news isn't working and trying to sensitize people also isn't um, sort of like sinking in. So you, if you go the soft way a bit, you then tend to go the hard way. Yes, people um, would um, contemplate and would, would argue with the fact that it is their property, probably they've purchased it and they have rights to it. But then it should come also with a guide. You have rights to it. Yes, no one is saying don't use your device, but then... Um, your your privacy is of utmost importance. Your security is important. So, in order to safeguard your privacy and security, we also need to put certain things in place. And I think that that would somewhat meet people halfway because, nonetheless, no one can stop saying they would use um, um, IoT devices probably because they have to update their. Once it becomes a need and a necessity. They, they will definitely um, make sure their security is protected and then we are all um, 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 good to go. Savio and Edgar, any thoughts? Savio is turning on his microphone, is that it? Uh, I think it's all. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Uh, and this this actually, this, this comment, this, this talks actually gave me a kind of existential crisis because I was considering different scenarios. <laughs> so for example, this is not quite quite simple depending on the context we are talking about, uh, like, like keeping things safe uh, in, in, in IoT. So I was, I was thinking about, for example, the scenarios of uh, at autonomous vehicles uh, where, for example, uh, we have one, a kind of uh, a open API that everyone agreed to use, uh, the same open uh, API and for communicating between the cars. Uh, and people rely on it to go to work, to go visit uh, family and so on, to have fun. Uh, so I have one car and there is one firmware update for my for for my for my my car, uh, to fix one bug that uh, uh, the bug make the car uh, cause some some accidents, and then it relies on the API, but uh, some regulations, some some legislation from the city like, uh, now you only have you only can use your car. Uh, if you have this firmware update uh, starting from this version and you have uh, two days to do it, or what happens if 
the cars, uh, the car reach the end of life of this. Uh, so this is basically going to change uh, by scenarios like uh, for smart cities, including uh, auto autonomous vehicles. Uh, this might have uh, a kind of regulation uh, on top of that, but for home, uh, for uh, in industrial, industrial IoT, uh, people care about that uh, at any time. Uh, but uh, for end users, we have different scenarios. Uh, uh, some uh, actually, yesterday I had one discussion with, with one friend, uh, and we were like uh, wondering about a, a kind of uh, firmware update center with some push uh, uh, alert for this, but this is uh, another discussion, but uh, this is basically the, the, the case. Uh, people will care, care about it, depending on the context. Uh, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> so I would still like to get to Atagi and I would still like to get to Edgar. So let's try to do this maybe as a Edgar, a uh, minute and a half or two minutes, and we get give the word to Atagi to give our audience uh, uh, like the final word, which I think is fair. Yeah, um, I I just wanted to reinforce pretty much the same the same point that that Xavier was saying. Like making an update no, is not always desirable. Many times it brings issues. So you you just do the update and then you're your things don't work. So then what, what happened with the users? They don't want to do updates. They think everything is fine. Why do I need to touch it? So then there is this mentality about like, if, if it's not broken, don't touch it. So then changing this mentality, it requires that you should at least be able to do some sort of simulation and see like, does my system works? Can I actually, I mean, somehow do some kind of preemptive check that is it everything going to be fine? Part of that is being addressed in today by the industry using digital twins. So the idea of digital twin is that you have a digital copy of the device or whatever thing you are utilizing. And then you could actually simulate how this di digital copy of the, let's say, the physical thing would interact with your other systems before you actually get it get it to work. So one possibility is that all this kind of management and so on goes in that direction where you actually handle everything to digital twins. And then in that way, you could actually think about it like, okay, I did this update in the digital twin, nothing happened, things were working fine. So now I do it in, in physical. So that, that that is one possible solution. That, that is in the solution space. Now, in the how we get the people mentality to think about this, uh, let's do updates, let's keep our software and so on. I think it, it will come naturally the more, uh, let's say the more these uh, kind of things are propagating in our lives. So, I mean, today, whenever I, I get an update for an app, you, you think about it like, do I do the update or not in our phones? Then you think like, oh, but then I'm losing this, this or that new functionality if I don't do it. And then I think the same will happen with devices and so on. So they, 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 you will get additional value, not only fixes for security or fixes for this kind of other issue. So I think also they could be additional value that then that will start to come in the, in the mind of the people that if I add this and I do this kind of update, then I will get get additional things. And maybe the digital twin is one good, good way also to show up that in advance. So that was about Perfect. It. I don't want to go over too much. Maybe I'll go over five minutes if the, the organization doesn't mind. So Watagi, I give you 30 seconds. Uh, we've got one panelist to answer a burning question and I'll move to wrapping up the session. Go. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I just had one question I just wanted to ask. Um, what um, an IoT, probably like Utopia, you know, the closest you can get to affect, because I'm sure perfection cannot be achieved, like what it would um, 
uh, look like. Um, I mean, I still don't believe we can uh, get it without citizens at the center because it's for the citizens. But um, but I was wondering like, what are like the things that need to be at the center of it? Obviously, this discussion is like about security, so it has to be secure. But um, what would be the uh, like the best possible thing that would happen in this field to uh, make everyone like engaged and stuff like that. And I saw Juanion uh, talked about incentives, which is a good kind of answer. Yeah, I like. But yeah, yeah, that's what my question. Is. Here's my idea. We we'll each give a phrase about this or like yeah. a small set of phrases. Uh, to me, what I think we need is to actually be able to get uh, more informed opinion in the in the mainstream media. We need people who want to communicate um, things in a simpler manner. That's not sim That's not just hey, this is scary. This is gonna hurt you. But people who actually manage to translate the information that we discuss on the on this uh, on this fora and actually get it to the media in a way that still it's still comprehensible. It still makes sense. It's still true and accurate but at the same time helps people understand what we are discussing and why. Uh, Savio. Uh, I have uh, actually no, not nothing to add about this, but less, less comments in the overall session. Uh, this kind of discussion about IoT security design is, is also being carried in, in the DC-80 POS. So please join us. We have one the general meeting tomorrow here in, in the IGF and one networking session in the Friday. And uh, this discussion is, is under the, the IoT Cyber Security by Design uh, Working Group. Uh, DC-80 POS is the Dynamic Collision Internet Security, uh, Internet Standard se uh, Security and Safety. Uh, and also, please, please feel free to make any comments uh, also in my draft in IATF, if you are in IATF or you want to join IATF, please feel free. Bye-bye. Thank you. Edgar. Everything is interoperability. So we need system to talk to each other and to understand. So it's not only about like, yeah, I can I, I can send packets from this and that, but also understand the semantics of what what is being what is possible to be done by one device but another device, and then how they could actually interact with each other. And then I think there you get these layers of um, also of things like security and, and policies that we have been talking about that are needed to be taken care in, in a semantic, in a semantic uh, level. So I would say that what it needs to happen in IoT is semantic interoperability. <laughs> so then when that we achieve that uh, in a higher scale, I think things in IoT will skyrocket. It will start to, to happen everywhere. Beautiful, Marta, take us home. Okay, yeah, so I, I also think it's just about um, getting it to the barest minimal, um, should I say, design process such that um, almost everyone with um, the least, should I say, usable device can, can actually interact with um, um, IAT devices. And that, that would make it um, a bit more appealing for more people so that they don't think about probably the economic implications or the financial implications upon them. Thank you a lot, everyone. This has been a great session, uh, great participation. Thank you, everyone, for, for attending. We had a, a lot of uh, interesting diversity here. We, we had people from every continent discussing something that I think all of us really care about. So it's always great when, when we see a, an IGF session going you know, in the way that, that we wish it would. So thank you, first and foremost, to our audience for being here. And thank you for the panelists as well. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be able to continue this discussion, bringing all of our different, you know, perspectives and continents together, Latin American representation, Africa and Europe, Asia. We have all, all of, our, of our experts in the audience, so it's always great to be able to do this. Uh, th thank you, everyone. And if you want to add anybody, any of these young luminaries here, find them over at LinkedIn and find their projects. They're really great people. 
uh, with that, I would like to bring the session to a close and wish you all a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. And yeah, feel free to catch up with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fine. And you win. Claps for you all. There you go. Let's... Thank you. Bye.